I, I, we, we say it, and uh, I don't know that we can say it enough. We are blessed at this congregation. Amen? We are blessed to have men who are able to step up at any point and lead in a vast variety of ways. We are blessed to have women who can step in to lead one another, who teach our young children, who teach our ladies' classes, who help make sure that, that when we have potlucks, that we have good food to eat and we're not stuck with bad stuff that would be done if us men were taking over those potlucks. I mean, we, God's blessed us so much. And, uh, and, and I don't know of any better way to spend my Sunday evening than with you. Uh, and, and so we're grateful that you're here. I, I know we have a couple of visitors that are with us tonight, and we are grateful that you have come our way. If you're looking for a church home, uh, we, we hope that you'll give Highland Heights a good look. We are, uh, we are a wonderful, close-knit family. We want to serve the Lord. And that's really the long and the short of it. We believe in the inspiration of His Word. We believe in salvation by grace through faith. And we believe that there is a day coming when we are going to be called home to spend eternity with Him. And uh, we just simply want to be Christians in a very complex world. As being part, and, and part of that call, part of that process of, of being simply Christians in a very complex world, in, in my judgment, you may disagree, but I don't think you will. In my judgment, one of the greatest experiences that God's people can have is the ability and privilege to gather together and worship our Creator. It, it, is, just, it is just simply one of the best things that we can do. It is good for the soul. It is good for our faith. And it brings excitement and it brings joy and it is supposed to bring inspiration to, to our lives when, when we may be out and about all week long and, and we may have some really difficult times. I mean, I know that, you know, being here all day long, you know that I've really got it tough when I have to put up with FH all week long. But, but, but some of y'all really have it tough out there, you know it? You, uh, you go to work and you have bosses and fellow employees that, they don't share the same faith that you do. You, you find yourself on the receiving end of criticisms and, and, and you find yourselves having to step up and defend your faith over and over and over again. And isn't it great to be able to come here to have our souls revived in singing praises to God and speaking together as His family in prayer and and to study from His Word, to teach us how we are to, to live our lives and how to be stronger in our faith. Isn't that just a great blessing, church? Amen, Amen indeed. And one of the other things that I really like about Scripture or about this idea of worship is I like the fact that we can do it confidently. You know, there, there are places throughout this world. We, we have brothers and sisters in other parts of this world that they, they are still having to meet in secret. And, and, and we know that throughout history, there have been times in which people would approach God and, and, and they would do so with a level of fear that almost superseded their, their love and, and closeness to Him. But one of the great things that the Bible teaches us regarding this avenue of worship is that here in this Christian era, we as disciples of Jesus Christ, the recipients of His grace, we have the ability to be able to come before God in this avenue of worship with great confidence. Some of our translations will use the word boldness that we are able to come before His throne. For instance, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Hebrew author says, Let us then with confidence or boldness draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to, uh, grace to help us in our time of need. Later on, in, in chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, the Hebrew author will say, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. There's that confidence again. 
full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then the Apostle Paul will add in Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, that it is in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. We are able to come before the presence of God. It brings my joy, it brings my spirit joy to know that I can approach God with such confidence, with, with such security, to be able to offer my, my sacrifice of praise and worship and to lift my petitions to Him. I don't have to be terrified or have to be afraid that He's not listening and that He's not receiving. But I also think that in an era when we can when we can come so comfortably and so regularly into God's presence, I, I would also, I also think that sometimes it's easy to overlook and to forget that there is another side of worship. I, I, it's what you might call the hard hat side of worship. That, and by hard hat, here's, here's what I mean. You know, when do you put on a hard hat? You put on a hard hat in a, in a construction zone, right? When you are walking into an area where you need to have a sense of caution. When you need to have a, an acute sense of awareness. Because if you step in the wrong place, if, if you come at it with, a, with an air of flippancy and, and you don't respect what's going on at that location, you might find yourself a little bit, uh, you, you might find yourself hurt because you treated that area and that place dismissively. And I think when we come to the idea of worship, there, there is a, a, an aspect about that that we could, and I don't think it's, I hope you don't think it's an overstatement, but I, I think there's an idea that, that we still need to have this hard hat approach of sorts. As you go through the scriptures, there, there are a few worshipers of God that we read about in scripture who were famously reminded of this need to approach God's presence with awareness. And, and if you want, maybe even with the word caution. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, as, as Moses came before God in that burning bush on Mount Sinai, as he approached, the Lord said to him, Moses, don't come any closer. Take the sandals off of your feet because the place that you are standing is holy ground. You better treat this spot with reverence. And, and then we would find uh, a few years later, uh, a couple of years later, when, when uh, God had instituted the Mosaic Covenant. We would find in Leviticus chapter 10, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. And they, they were operating, serving as priests of God, but, but one day they, they came to the offering with, a, with, with fire from an unauthorized source. God had been very specific. When you bring the fire for the offering, you use, you use the flame from a very specific source, and they didn't do that. Some, some, Bible, uh, some Bible scholars have, have thought or suggested that, that maybe the, what happened is that they had been indulging in a little bit too much to drink and maybe they had come to him with, in, in a little bit of a drunken stupor. And the reason we say that is as you keep on reading in the passage, it is shortly, it is in the wake of their deaths that God puts a very strict rule against the priest consuming alcoholic beverages. And so maybe they had come to God in, in, a, in, a, in a little bit of a drunken stupor and so they, they didn't treat this time of worship with the reverence and awe that it demanded. And then as you go into the time of the prophets, we, we know that Isaiah understood this idea of, of, uh, uh, of this caution or this, this awareness, this hard hat attitude of when you come into the presence of God. Because in Isaiah... Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, when he sees the vision of the throne of God and, and, and the angels that are there in front of him, he says, Oh, woe is me, for I am lost, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord of hosts. What is, what is he afraid of? He's afraid of the fact that he is now in the presence of God and he sees himself as being completely unworthy of being in that place, of being in that, in that space with the Lord. And we see the mercy of God, do we not? Because God will send one of those seraphs, one of those seraphim over to take a coal off of the, off of the altar and go and He will touch His lips and He says, your sins have been atoned. And then God, then He is able to be in the presence of God without fear. And if you would, open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we have another passage that we're going to have as our main text for tonight. And, and we have yet another passage that, that gives us this same concept. It gives us this, this idea that we need to have a self-awareness, that we need to be fully engaged, if you will, in understanding of our surroundings when we come into the presence of God. And Because in, in Ecclesiastes, I think I said Ecclesiastes, hopefully I didn't say Ephesians, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Solomon writes, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Watch where you're walking. Be careful of what you are doing when you go into the house of God. Now, listen, I, I, I understand and I will admit that... that when we look at these passages, we're talking about Mosaic Covenant under uh, in Old Testament times as far and, and New Testament era. And I, I understand that that you know, looking at Moses and Isaiah and Nadab and Abihu, that they were under a they were under a different religious system than we are now. But I want to suggest to you and I want to remind us that, that it is still important for us to know that even though we read of, of a Mosaic law that's followed by a Christian law, we are still serving the same God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul. And He's the same God that we serve today. And, and so therefore, I, I think what, what I want us to consider tonight is I, I think there are certain principles of approaching God in worship that remain true in all eras of history. Namely, I would give you this one to consider tonight. That when we enter the presence of holy God, we must be wholly present. When we enter the presence of holy God, we must be wholly present. Tonight I want to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And I want to observe three areas that, three areas of worship that, that Solomon discusses that, that, that I think can easily be filled with something other than our full attention and our full devotion when we come into the presence of God for periods of worship and service. Aspects of, of coming before the Lord that need to be given specific and purposeful effort to ensure that we are wholly present when we come into the presence of holy God. Let, let's read the text, uh, if you would, with me one more time. We, we had it read a little while ago, but let's refresh our memories. In, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know where th that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Notice that the first thing Solomon points out to, that, to us is that when we come into the presence of God, and one thing that we need to make sure we are wholly in tune with is he says we need to make sure that we emphasize listening over sacrifice. 
The act of sacrifice was, well, quite frankly, I mean, you, you know it. It was part and parcel of the temple worship. Whether it was the sin offerings that were offered daily by the priest, or it might have been the free will offerings that people would bring of their own volition to the temple to, to offer unto God, the people regularly engaged in the burning of animals and of grains as, a, as part of that cultic act of worship to Yahweh. These offerings were indeed special. I mean, if you stop to think about it for a minute, they are designed to be felt, are they not? If you've ever raised crops, if you have ever raised livestock, you know what the value would be for you to take one of your very, very best and go take it and have it slaughtered. You'd feel that. And they were designed to be such. It was designed to cost them something of value. And yet Solomon here, he, he warns, gives a, his warning indicates the possibility for something to be amiss in their sacrifices. Namely, that, that these sacrifices, the act of offering whatever it was on that altar, could shift into being what he calls the sacrifice of fools. Or perhaps another way of using that phrase is that it it could shift into sacrificing foolishly. And the way to understand how it could shift into that is, is by seeing what he pairs it with. Drawing near to listen. It is better to draw near to listen than to sacrifice. Here in this passage, the, the word listen is synonymous with this idea of obedience. In other words... Solomon is saying that, that when approaching the presence of God, it is more important for the worshiper to be ready to hear what God is trying to say and to be ready to obey it in every aspect of life. But unfortunately, God's people have uh, often got caught up into thinking that the act of sacrificing was a good substitute for obedience. One, one of the prime examples is, is King Saul in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He had been told to wait for Samuel. There will be a time when, when before battle he would need to meet up with Samuel and, and he waited and he waited and he waited and Samuel didn't come in the time that Saul thought he was supposed to come. And so instead of waiting for Samuel to be the one to offer the sacrifice because Samuel was the one authorized to do it, Saul took it upon himself. And he sacrificed, and, and, and then in Acts chapter, and then uh, you keep on going, and later on, we, we find actually 1 Samuel 15, I'm getting my stories mixed up, in 1 Samuel 15, we have where he was told to go uh, annihilate the Amalekites. And he was told very specifically, go and wipe them completely out. Do not leave anyone alive because this people is going to be a thorn in the side of Israel if you leave them alive. But instead of completely annihilating the, 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 the towns that he went to go to war with, he saved the best of the livestock. And he spared the life of the king. And when Samuel comes in and calls him out on it, why, why, did, you not, why did you not obey God fully? And he said, well, I, uh, well Samuel, I, I thought I would save the best of the animals to offer sacrifices to God. And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, Has the Lord so great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is more precious than the fat of rams. You could go to the prophets and, 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 and many, many years later, prophets like Isaiah and Amos and Micah, would address this very problem. They, they would tell the people on behalf of God, God is rejecting your sacrifices. You're still offering them, but your lives don't match the kind of obedience that God is looking for. You are cheating people. You're lying. You're, you're, going, against, you're going against everything that is morally right, but you're still offering sacrifices. And God said, I reject your sacrifices before me. 
God was not interested in them simply going through the motions. He wanted them to be wholly present when they came into His holy presence. And the same is true for us today. We mentioned this morning in our lesson that, that, that as Christians, our sacrifices to God do not consist of, of animals, but rather of spiritual offerings, such as our bodies, Romans chapter 12, uh, people who are one to the Savior, Romans 15, shared physical resources in Philippians 4, 18, and, and the, praise and good, the praise of our lips and the good works that we do, our sacrifices to our God, Hebrews chapter 13. Sometimes, though, if, if, we, if we're not careful, I, I think we too, even in this Christian era, we too fall into the trap of offering our sacrifices on Sunday or Wednesday as a way to make up for living unholy lives the rest of the week. It's almost as if we believe that going through the motions of worship can make up for not being completely devoted to God in every part of our lives. And by falling into this mentality, our sacrifices, though they may be correct in form, they are being sacrificed foolishly. The psalmist said in Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Moses and Jesus both warned the people of of their eras, of their times, they both said that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And when we come into the presence of our God, we must be wholly present by coming to Him with the intent to listen and to obey, not with the idea of substituting our sacrifices for obedience. But the other thing, the second thing that Solomon points out for us in our passage tonight in Ecclesiastes is he says, uh, be sure that you don't utter rash words. Uttering words to God is, I, I'm going to take this as another way of, of describing prayer. Prayer is, is another one of those greatest privileges that we have because we, we get to communicate directly with the Creator of all things. And so in the words of one commentator, prayer is serious business. It's like marriage. It must, be entered in, it must not be entered into lightly or carelessly, but soberly and in the fear of God. Rash words when we come before God and, and we utter rash words in our prayers, I, I think that happens, you know, for one reason or another, it... it they result when we allow the magnitude of the act of prayer to diminish in our minds. In some cases, we may lose the magnitude of prayer simply because we are preoccupied and we lack the focus. We haven't prepared properly for that time of prayer. At other times, no doubt you've run across people that you've heard pray in which you, you heard a flippancy. They, 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 were, they offered up flippant prayers and it made you wonder if they knew anything about the fear of the Lord just because they had no respect for the act of communicating with the Creator. And so it leaves us with the question, what should we be aware of? What should we be careful of in our prayer life so that we may be wholly present when we approach God at that time. How do we prevent ourselves from uttering rash words before Him? Well, I think Jesus answers that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. There in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, And when you pray, do not heap up empty words or empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. In other words, we must watch out for both hurried words and too many words. Similarly, we must also make sure that we're not praying in order to try to impress other people with our eloquence and our big, mighty language. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, just a couple of verses before, Jesus said, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, 
For they stand, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they already have their reward in full. But you see, the secret to acceptable praying, I think, is to have a prepared heart. Because as Jesus will also remind us in Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37, the mouth speaks what the heart contains. And if I want to be able to prevent rash words spoken to my Lord in the time of prayer, I need to make sure that my heart is properly prepared for that. And as a matter of practical application, there's a lot of different ways that we could apply this, but, but in this setting, let, let me offer an encouragement to my brothers here when, who, who come and who lead this body of people in prayer in these occasions and in our classes and, and when you're at home. Brothers, when, when we are asked to lead, the, to lead the church in prayer, let's make sure, let me encourage you to make sure that you take some time to prepare your mind for that. I know sometimes you may be put on the spot and you don't get a whole lot of time. I understand that. But, but most of the time, we, we, have, we have proper opportunity to think about it for a little bit. Take a few moments to think through what you're going to say. And if that means you have to, to get out a card and, and write down a few notes of what, you need, what you're going to lead in prayer, then do that. And I also want to encourage us that we, we want to be careful to, to not get stuck in the rut of repeating the same cliched phrases over and over and over every time we get up to talk to the Father. We, we, we kind of get frustrated when, when we go to talk to someone and we hear the exact same thing from them every time because it doesn't feel like it's a genuine conversation. I think it's important that we try to not get caught in that rut and that we learn and that we practice and we work and we, and we learn how to be able to, to just speak what's in our heart. Because when we come into God's holy presence in prayer, we need to be wholly present while we speak with Him. The third thing that I will share with you that comes out of Ecclesiastes chapter 5 tonight is, is a way that a way to guard ourselves when we come into the presence of God is, is he says you need to be serious in your vows. Under Mosaic law, we, we know that vows took place. But one thing that you need to understand in case, in case you hadn't put this together, un, under that Mosaic law, God did not require that the people make vows in order to please him. It was not required of them to do this. But rather, these vows were opportunities that God put in place or God allowed for the worshipers to be able to express their devotion to Yahweh if they felt compelled to do so. And you can go look at Deuteronomy chapter uh, 23 and, and Numbers chapter 30 and find the details of, of how those vows were, were treated before God. But one thing that's really important to understand about these vows is that, that just because they were not required by God did not mean that God wanted them taken lightly. Solomon addresses two particular sins that his readers would have struggled with perhaps when, when Israelite worshipers made a vow to God. Number one, he said, he said, don't make a vow with no intention of keeping it. Because that effectively results in, that, that effectively means you lied to God. You made a vow and, and you never intended to carry it all the way through. And then he'll also say in verse 6, don't delay in the fulfillment of a vow. Especially, don't delay in fulfilling it with the hopes that if you leave it sitting long enough, maybe you can get out of it. That's what he said. Don't, don't, be, don't be the one who the messenger comes to. And I think that means the messenger from the temple says, you made a vow, it's time to pay up on it. Don't be the one who receives the message and says, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, about that. Um, yeah, that was a mistake. I, uh, I, I didn't really mean to do that. And uh, you know, can, can I just get out of that? He said, don't have that kind of attitude toward your vows. You see, Solomon wants his readers to remember that God hears, that God heard what they said. And he holds them accountable. 
He holds them to their promises. To treat vows any other way is to show a, a lack of integrity, to a lack of love for God's holiness and an absence of clear thinking and judgment regarding the acts of devotion that you make before Him. Now, when we come into the Christian era, the notion of religious vows, at least that language, has all but disappeared. We, we don't talk about making vows uh, religious vows uh, of this same nature before God. And, and I think there's good reason for that. I mean, when you go through the New Testament, we, there are no specific guidelines regarding vows made to God per se. But consider it doesn't mean that Christians don't make vows to God. You actually do see it happening in the New Testament. I'll give you an example. What about the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16? They had made a vow that they would pay, contribute a certain amount of money toward, the, toward helping the, the hungry Christians in Jerusalem. They had promised that this is what they would do. And in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul's writing them and says, you made this promise and I've been telling everybody about the vow that you made and you're not following through. And so he gave them the plan that they were going to use on, on how to save that money so that he wouldn't have to go around collecting when he got there. And so it's not that Christians don't make vows or make promises and things that we're going to do in our devotion and dedication to God and to His family. And with that being the case, I think the principle still holds true today as it, is, as it did in ancient times. God hears what we say, and He holds us to our promises. Now, look, as I say that, I, let, let me put this little caveat to it. I, I, I understand that there might be times when, when providence and circumstances beyond our control prevent us from fulfilling a promise made. I get that. And, and I believe that God would understand if we were unable to fulfill a promise or a vow because of circumstances beyond our control. But what about those times when, when someone commits to doing something so that, uh, so that they can impress other people? I will make this grandiose public statement of what I'm going to do for God and for His church because I want people to know how righteous I am. Or maybe, maybe they get caught up in, in, in trying to, to bribe God. Oh, Lord, if you'll just get me out of this, I'll, I'll give $200 to the missions program at church. You ever heard somebody do something like that? Such vows are made. I think you and I understand that, that vows of that nature are typically being made when someone's mind is not wholly present before God. Those are the kinds of vows that are, that are made with no real intent to fulfill them or maybe they'll make them hoping that they can stave it off long enough that maybe everyone will forget about it and they won't have to fulfill it. And then they come to church. And then they come to the assembly with, with the Christian family and they gather into the presence of God for worship and they act as if nothing has been said. Doesn't it make you wonder just a little bit how God is going to hold us accountable for those kinds of careless words that are spoken? Church, let us not squander the value of our vows by failing to be wholly present when we make them in the presence of holy God. You see, the privilege of worshiping God is among the greatest honors that we have as human beings. And yes, we come to Him with confidence and with boldness through the blood of Jesus. We do not have to fear for our lives when we approach His throne. We do not have to be fearful that God is not going to be ready and anxious and willing to hear us and to respond to us in some way. But boldness does not mean flippancy or irreverence. It's quite the opposite, actually. As sincere worshipers of the one true God, we must always approach Him with awe and with wonder, with awareness of the great magnitude of the event that is happening when we come before Him. We must guard our steps by making sure that our minds are fully engaged 
in the actions that we have set ourselves to, whether that is the offering of spiritual sacrifices to God, speaking with Him in prayer, or making vows and promises of devotion to Him. Because when we come into the presence of holy God, we must be wholly present when we do so. Tonight, it may be that you need to respond to the Lord's invitation. It may be that, that there's a need for you to give your life to Jesus in the waters of baptism. We want to help you with it. It may be that you have allowed life and distractions to cause this time of worship to become less important. Maybe your mind is distracted by cares. Maybe you're reaching the point that it just doesn't mean as much as it used to. I would say that's a heart issue that needs to be addressed. And, and if there's a way that we can lift you up to God, if there's a way that, that we can encourage you and pray with you and love on you in such a way that it helps you become more engaged with God in these times and, within, and with every moment of your life, we want to help you. If we, can, if we can pray for you, if we can wrap our arms around you and love you, if there's anything we can do at all, this invitation is being sung as an opportunity for you to respond. What will you do with that opportunity while we stand and sing?